boring. And I, oh, there's the microphone starting to work. Thanks, Ted. Uh, review sounds boring and uninteresting, but it's not. It's taking everything and wrapping it all together, making it all come together and make sense. So, um, yeah, I still call it review, but I'll be putting that disclaimer in there as well. So let's go through some questions first. You want know to look at last time? Okay, though Jesus submitted his human will to that of his heavenly father, he agonized over the what he was about to face. What do you think, D? Pain? Good? Yeah. Here I have suffering, but it's the same idea. Yeah, very good. When the mob sent to arrest Jesus told him who they were looking for, Jesus acknowledged who he was with. Jesus acknowledged who he was with an emphatic I am. A literal translation of the original language would be what? Think about the effect that it had on the, uh, the crowd who was looking for him. I might give you a, a hint. What's that, Janice? Yeah, very close. I am right now, God. Right? In reaction to Jesus identifying himself as I am, what happened to the crowd, Preeti? This is in the garden when they came to arrest Jesus. Nope, not quite. Larry. Yeah, they fell backward. That's exactly right. Fell backward and to the ground. Had a, had a powerful impact on them. Very good. When Jesus told Peter to protect him, he cut off a servant's ear. You think, Jason, is that true? Think it's true, Grace? Why is it false, Grace? That's right. He didn't tell Peter to protect him. He did cop a servant here, but he did it on his own. Jesus wasn't trying to defend himself. False. When the high priest asked Jesus, are you the promised deliverer? Jesus answered with one expression. Remember what that was, Abby? No? Chris? Yes? Nope. Not quite. Kieran? He said, I am. That's right. It's just kind of a way of saying yes. It's got a little more power to it. Though a king, Jesus had no political ambitions. His reign began in where? Anybody. I was going to pick an Emily, but she just sat down. And I already picked up Preeti when she just first sat down. That didn't work out so well. In the hearts of people. That's right. That's right. Good. Good job, Jandel. The night court held by the Sanhedrin was what? It was illegal. That's right, Larry. Completely illegal. The Sanhedrin found Jesus guilty on two charges, but only one was accurate. I if you notice, the questions got harder. I don't have a multiple choice thing. I have a lot of fill in. Because you guys are so smart, we're, we're, we're approaching the end here. <coughs> what do you guys think? Okay. It was actually Christ or Messiah was one, making himself out to be, that's what they found him guilty of. What was the other one they accused him of? That's right, not paying taxes. Very good. He claimed to be Christ, Messiah, and he, they said he forbid the payment of taxes to Caesar. Which one was actually accurate? What's that? Yeah, he claimed to be the Christ. They were right. He was completely guilty of that. And he had the, the miracles to prove it. Neither Herod nor Pilate could find Jesus guilty of anything deserving the death penalty. True or false? What do you think, Karen? Yeah. 
True, that's right. Very good. Crucifixion was a Roman form of capital punishment used only for who? Notorious people? Okay, similar. Larry? That's right. Slaves and criminals. Very good. The lowest. King David wrote about the Messiah's crucifixion how many years before it became Rome's official form of capital punishment? Again, King David is writing in the Psalms, the Jewish scriptures, so many years before Rome even used it as capital punishment. How many years was that? Does anyone remember? 800, very good, on a roll. Okay, Jesus assured the thief on the cross next to him that he would go to paradise because he was putting his what in Jesus. What do you think? What do you think, Jason? Trust in Jesus? Okay, trust in Jesus to deliver him from what? That's right, very good. It's trust in Jesus to deliver him from the consequences of sin, which includes eternal punishment. Very good. When Jesus died, the temple curtain was in front of the Holy of Holies. Remember the temple? The, the, it was like the tabernacle. It was split up in one-third and two-thirds, and there was a, a curtain there, a veil, a curtain, and it was torn from top to bottom. Why was it significant? This was significant because of why? Two main reasons. Because it's made of thick fabric? Okay, very good. Why else? What was the consequence for going behind the veil? That's right, you would die. To look behind the curtain was to die, and only God could have torn that curtain so thick, as thick as a man's hand um, from top to bottom. It's impossible for man to do so. The Greek word, which is translated, it is finished, had many different usages during the time of Christ, and we talked about them. We talked about at least three of them. What are the three meanings we looked at? What kind of applications did we talk about? The word is tetelestai, and there were three different ways it could be used at that time. You remember one of them? Okay, in a financial environment, right? Like a debt. The debt is paid. It's completely paid in full. Finished. To tell us die. Good. What else? Servant was given a job to do by his master. Did the job. The job is completed. Finished. Good. That's two. What's the last one? Nobody? Veronica. That's right. Finding a sacrifice. Got to find a spotless, perfect lamb, right? We found it. The search is over. The telestai. We found the lamb. Okay, very good. There's your answers there at the bottom, just in case. We don't need them. You guys did great. The day Jesus died was the climax of the Passover week, the day when the lamb was killed. True or false? Yeah, it's true. It's preparation day. That's right. The tomb where they laid the body of Jesus after he had died was very secure because it was what? It was sealed. It had a seal on it. The Roman governor's seal was on it. That's correct. Why else? That's right. It's like trained soldiers were guarding it. That's correct. Good. When the angel of the Lord appeared in front of the tomb, the guards initially fought the angel, passed out, overcome with fear, ran away in terror. What do you think, Abby? Think they passed out? They got so afraid? You're right. They did. I think, yeah, I think just about anybody would. The angel told Mary 
and Salome that Jesus was what? Jesus was what, Larry? He was risen. Very good. Just calling the Zoom folks back in here, giving them a minute warning. The Bible says that when John saw the tomb, he what? When he saw the empty tomb. Excuse me. What do you think, Gia? When, he saw, when John saw the tomb, he didn't go in? Okay. Actually, you're right. He didn't go in. Peter went in. But what did both of them do about it? What did John do about what he saw there? Emily? No? D'Angelo? It's like I picked a hard one. Grace? He believed. That's right. Peter was still thinking, dazed, kind of confused. John saw and he believed. Jesus, the anointed one, had crushed Satan's what? Just as God had promised back in the Garden of Eden, Andy. Any guess? Nope. Karen? His head, that's right. Remember? God had promised to um, Eve that the seed of the woman that Satan would crush his foot, his heel, but Satan would have his head crushed by Eve's seed, which is Jesus. Good. Death, death is the result of sin. Jesus did not have to die because he was what? Why did Jesus not have to die? Because he was what? Yeah, he was perfect. That's right. He died. Why? Because he was perfect? No, nope. something else there besides perfection or sinlessness. How did he die? Yeah, that's very good. He died willingly. That's right. I'm going to get more into that today. It was out of love. Very good. Okay, very good. That should have been more than enough time to get the Zoom folks back online, and we'll start the um, rest of the classes. So some of you just joined us. Um, one of the things I mentioned was, I'm calling this a review. That sounds so boring, uh, in a sense, because you know, a comprehensive review just sounds like the teacher giving you a semester review, and it sounds really tedious and boring. This isn't. This is where all the pictures come together, and all the pieces become clear, and the pieces start fitting into the right spots. Okay? So, let's uh, start off basically where we started in the very beginning. That very day, and again, where we left off with Jesus had been risen from the dead, right? So this is still what we call Easter Sunday or the Sunday, the first day of the week when Jesus rose from the dead. It's still the same day, but this is one account that we didn't cover last week. And it should sound highly familiar if you remember the very first class that we did together. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Is this story sounding familiar? These are the disciples. Uh, they weren't part of the inner circle of the original 12 disciples. They too were followers of Jesus. Then one of them named Cleopas answered, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem? who does not know the things that have happened there in these days. And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, 
and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we, have hope, but we had hoped that, it was, that, he was, that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. More, moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when, they, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. So you see these two disciples, uh, they, they give him the, a little summary of the day. Of course, none of this was new news to Jesus, but he waited quietly and patiently for them to finish And he had some news for them too. Jesus said, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus told them that the Messiah had to suffer and to die. And then come back to life. He said it was necessary. And you can imagine just the, the, the eyebrows being raised in these disciples. Their, their thoughts about the Messiah were completely different. They're expecting a conquering king, not a suffering savior. But Jesus didn't stop there. He went back into the Jewish scriptures and taught them about himself. Starting at the very beginning and progressing step by step and story by story through the entire Bible. It must have been quite a Bible lesson. As they, and they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? So their new excitement gave lay, their, their, their new understanding gave excitement, it gave uh, speed to their legs. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And you can imagine that trip back to Jerusalem as they were very excited by all that Jesus had shown, shown them from the scriptures. They went back to the 11 disciples. Obviously, Judas wasn't there. He had committed suicide. Um, but the journey was all uphill. But you can just imagine them pushing themselves all the way back to Jerusalem because they had good news. There they found the 11 and those who were with them, assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, still not believe it because of all of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Just as Jesus had done with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he did the same thing with these 11 disciples. And he explained the things surrounding his death and his resurrection. He took the Jewish scriptures, the three sections, the law, the writings, and the prophets. And he took each of those segments and he showed his followers how they all applied to him. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will, will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. 
Jesus said his death, burial, and resurrection must happen to fulfill scripture. He went on to say this was such good news that it would be told everywhere beginning at Jerusalem. And before we go on with the story, we want to stop and go back. We want to do just what Jesus did. We want to see what Jesus said about himself, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Exactly why did Jesus come to earth? Why did he have to suffer and die? When all along he planned to come back to life anyway, why didn't he just simply tell people to believe in him and skip the entire crucifixion? What were these events all about? It's death, burial, and resurrection. The last piece of the puzzle is going to be put into place. And when you understand where that fits in, it makes the whole picture come clear. So to answer this question, why did Jesus have to die? We have to go back in time to the very beginning. Remember when God made Adam and Eve, the very beginning of creation? God did not make man as a robot but with a will, one to have choices and to obey God and show God honor just like a son honors his father. You'll recall that through obedience, man enjoyed tremendous benefits from his relationship. And remember, we talked about that paddle, that that, that canoe paddle, where we said, he who made the paddle, what? That's right. He who made the paddle owns the paddle. That's right. Very good. Well, the creator of the universe, as man's creator and owner, was committed to Adam and Eve's well-being, walking and talking with them as their friend. But But then Adam and Eve deliberately ignored God's instructions and experimented with forbidden knowledge. Since the events surrounding this incident contain critical elements of the puzzle, the scripture uses powerful pictures in words to help us understand what happened. The Bible says that man felt he knew better than God what was good for him. He chose his own path to do his own thing, but that path led into a spiritual wilderness. What was the result? Man was lost. Instead of listening to God, man trusted and believed Satan. Man joined Satan's rebellious ranks, thus becoming an enemy of God. But such choice has ramifications. The scripture teaches us that the effects of sin are very costly. Because there was no trust, there was no relationship. Immediately, the unique friendship between God and man ended. Separated by sin, man was estranged from the perfect holy God. God was no longer close. He seemed remote and distant. Satan was not the benevolent friend God had been. Rather, the devil manipulated man with lies to to do his satanic will. Man became a slave to Satan and a slave to sin. In choosing his own way, man disobeyed the one command that God had given him. And that doesn't go without consequences or harm. Remember, when you break a law, there's always consequences, whether it's a physical law or a spiritual law. There's always consequences to breaking God's laws. When man sinned, God took off his coat of friendship and he put on a judge's robe. As man's judge, God found man guilty of a crime, of breaking his law, of sinning against a holy God. In essence, God wrote out a verdict, a certificate of debt. Man was now a debtor with a price to pay. The penalty for sin is death. Every human being would now die physically. The spirit would be separated from the body, the life separated from family and friends. Where we talked about that, just as if you cut off a branch from a tree, it might look green for a while, but it's cut off from its source of life. It's eventually just going to wither away because it's now dead. In the same way man was cut off from life, man would eventually die physically. 
because the stench of sin corrupted man's total being, and we talked about those stinking rats, uh, the roof rats I had. He had a rat underneath his uh, place where he was staying. Because that stench of sin corrupted man's total being, God separated himself from mankind. Man's relationship with God was over. It was dead. After physical death, there would be a second death. Man would be separated forever from God and his expressions of love. He would be confined in the lake of fire, the place that God had created for Satan and his demons. Death in its three aspects ruled man's life, and he could do nothing about it. Man had no choice as to whether he wanted to to die or not. It was a bitter, potent reality that all faced, that all shared, that all who thought soberly about it feared. With absolute, utter finality, the scripture clearly states, a person shall die for his own sin, These word pictures help us understand just how far removed from God mankind had become as a result of Adam and Eve's sin. Man was faced with the age-old question, how can we get rid of sin with all its consequences and gain a righteousness equal to God's righteousness so we can be accepted into God's presence? Let's think back. You remember the desperate attempt of Adam and Eve how they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves after they had sinned against God. We saw that God rejected their fig leaves, but he did not leave them just with a rejection. He didn't just leave them in a lurch. Rather, he does what? He devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him. The Lord used these events to teach Adam and Eve, as well as us, universal principles that apply to all mankind. Just as Adam and Eve could not make themselves acceptable to God by fixing their outward appearance, neither can we be accepted based on our externals. We may impress others with what we are on the outside, but God knows who we really are on the inside. We saw that God provided Adam and Eve with a way of acceptance, but on different terms, on his terms. The Bible says that The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. The significance of this little expression could be easily overlooked if it wasn't for other parts of the Bible explaining it. So what does it mean? What would Jesus have told the disciples as he's explaining this to them, the two on the road to Emmaus, the 11 back in Jerusalem, all the ones that were gathered there? What would he be saying? It'd be simply this. Just as an animal had to die to clothe Adam and Eve in acceptable clothing, so Jesus had to die to make us, you and me, acceptable in the presence of God. This was and is God's idea. It's God's way of acceptability. As the disciples struggled to comprehend what Jesus was saying, You can only imagine the flood of questions they would have. Why would God require an animal to die for Adam and Eve? Why didn't God simply clothe them with with his choice leaves? And why would Jesus have to die for us? Was there not another way? We can only assume Jesus would just continue with the story. And where would he go next? Well, we see Cain and Abel. You remember the children of Adam and Eve, how they brought sacrifices to God. Why did they do that? We saw that the escape route God had provided had two dimensions. There was an inward aspect, something they had to work through in their hearts, a a choice that Cain Cain and Abel each had to make on their own. And there was an outward aspect, a visual aid to help them understand what it would take to remove sin. Remember how we saw that Cain and Abel brought their sacrifices to God. Cain brought vegetables from his garden, but Abel brought the firstborn from his flock. God rejected Cain's sacrifice, but he accepted Abel's. Why? Remember Cain, he did not not believe God. He had his own ideas 
about how to get rid of sin, how to be right with God. He'd fit in right with our world today. Many people come with their own notions about who God is and how to please them. It's become very fashionable to have a personally tailored theory about who God is. A custom-designed God is in vogue. Cain would feel right at home today. And outwardly, based on his thinking, Cain did his own thing. He brought a sacrifice that did not illustrate God's way of dealing with the sin problem. Vegetables do not shed blood. Cain ignored the fact that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. His sacrifice did not provide an atonement covering. The Bible tells us, do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one. His own actions were evil, and his brothers were righteous. On the other hand, Abel, God accepted his sacrifice. Abel was trusting in the Lord to be his savior. That was what was going on in his mind. He made a choice to trust God, to come to God God's way. And that's what God wanted. God still wants people to trust him. We're told repeatedly throughout the scripture that we are to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our savior. And what was the outward expression? God accepted Abel's sacrifice because it illustrated what Jesus accomplished on the cross. It pictured substitution, that just as an innocent animal died in Abel's place, so Jesus, innocent of all sin, died in our place, paying the death penalty for us. For Christ also suffered, for one, also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. It pictured atonement, just as an animal shed its blood so Abel might have a covering for sin. In the same way, Jesus offered himself as the ultimate blood sacrifice so we might have forgiveness of sin. The Bible says that the relationship that was broken by disobedience is now restored through Jesus' death on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. As children of Adam and Eve, we were born into this world as enemies of God. We talked about that. It's a harsh reality, but it is reality. It's like being born in the wrong side of World War II if you're born at that time. We were born enemies of God. But now, because of Jesus' physical death on the cross, we're reconciled. We can be friends again with God. The broken relationship has been restored. Some may say, okay, I, I can see how Jesus' death took care of our sin problem, but how do we gain a righteousness equal to God's righteousness so we can be accepted into his presence? As we said many classes ago, that question is it's too Sides of the same coin. You can't really divide them. We need to get rid of the sin that we don't want and its consequences, but we need a righteousness that will make us acceptable before God. We'll see that when God took care of our sin problem, he also addressed this lack of righteousness. Remember Noah, the people of Noah's day? They just ignored God's word. Perhaps they thought the old man was crazy building a boat, probably in the middle of nowhere not near any water. Whatever the case, they persuaded themselves that life existed only for the here and now. God did not withhold his judgment because they had the wrong philosophy of life. They perished in their foolishness. More than likely, millions if not billions of people on the earth and only eight were saved. God was saying this, just as the people of Noah's day were judged for their sin, so God will judge all men regardless of how they think. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. God will, will let us ignore him and even reject his way of escape for a time. Remember, God is patient. He's not tolerant. Because patience has an end. Eventually, we must 
face an inescapable conclusion. We must pay our sin debt with eternal death. Remember how Noah and his sons were kept safe in the ark? There was only one boat, and that one boat had one what? Had one door to enter in by. And that's what was their refuge from the flood. There was no other option. There is no plan B. That's it. It's in the same way Jesus Christ is the only way to eternal life. Just as safety can only be found inside the one ark through that one door, so only in Jesus can we find safety from everlasting punishment. Jesus was very clear about this. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's, there is only one way to God. Those who ignore or reject the way those who ignore or reject that way face the same fate as those who did not heed Noah's warnings. The flood was coming for sure in Noah's day. Eternal death is coming for all who don't come to God through Christ. The Bible is very clear. Jesus is the only way to God. Well, what about those other ways that people believe in? Remember we talked about Babel, the first incident of organized religion, the people who tried to build a tower to reach up to the heavens. We said that a definition of the word religion is man's efforts to reach God. At Babel, man slaved away with brick and tar. In the same way, religion is a taskmaster that requires constant struggle. It demands ever-increasing efforts to please God or gods or spirits only to never know for sure that you've arrived, that you've pleased them. In contrast to religion, the Bible says that the only true way to God was provided by the Lord himself. When in his mercy, God reached down to man. Instead of religion reaching up to God, God reaches down to man in the person of Jesus Christ. All the work needed to restore the broken relationship was done by Jesus on the cross. You can only wonder at the excitement these disciples must have had as they listened to God's plan through thousands of years of history being fulfilled right there in Jesus as he's explaining it to them. For centuries, man had looked forward to the day when he would be delivered from judgment of sin. And there he was explaining it to them for the first time. Now that time had come. Jesus wasn't finished with his explanation though. He continued no doubt with the story of Abraham and Isaac. Remember when Abraham was asked by God to offer Isaac, his son, as a sacrifice? Isaac was under God's order to die in reality. He deserved to die, for he was a sinner. Isaac was bound and placed on the altar, helpless. What God was saying was this. Just as Isaac was helpless and could not save himself... So all, so all of us are bound by sin and cannot save ourselves from, the con, from its consequences. Remember how Abraham took a knife and prepared to plunge it into Isaac? Abraham was trusting in God's goodness to provide a solution to death. At the last moment, what happened? God called from heaven and stopped him because, Abraham, because of Abraham's trust, the Lord provided a substitute in the place of Isaac, a substitute sacrifice. Just as Abraham died in Isaac's place, so Jesus died in our place. We should have died and been punished for our sin, but Jesus died and took our punishment on the cross. He died as our substitute. If the ram had not died, Isaac would have perished. If Jesus had not died, we, you and I, we'd have to pay our own sin debt for all eternity. The Bible says that God honored Abraham's faith. Abraham believed God and it was a credit to him as righteousness. Remember that certificate of debt 
We looked at that before. That every human has as a result of sin. This is the thing that in the back of your heart, in the back of your mind weighs on you. That you know is out there. That the wrongs that you've done against God. And we learn from the Bible that the payment for sin is death. It's the only payment for sin. The Bible says that God credited righteousness to Abraham's account. Why? Simply by faith. God did that for Abraham because the Lord was because the Lord was looking ahead to what Jesus would do on the cross. The Bible says this, it's very very important. The words it was credited to him. This is later in the New Testament talking about that situation that happened back in Genesis about Abraham. The the words it was credited to him were written not for him, Abraham alone, but also for us, to whom God will give, to whom God will credit righteousness, to you and to me, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. You see that? It's important words here. It was credited to him. And those words were not just for Abraham. It says they were also written to us, to whom God will credit righteousness. Down through the history of man, every person has carried this certificate of debt, a massive sin debt that each one of us is accountable to pay. The only way that debt could be paid was with one's own eternal death. But then Jesus came. His death completely paid man's sin debt, past, present, and future. That is why Jesus cried out, What did he cry out? It is finished. The debt is paid. But the payment made by Jesus is only effective if one believes. The Bible says, God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Remember that word believe, as used in the Bible, has a fuller meaning than most people tend to give it. Believe, what does it mean? It means the same thing as faith, trust, have confidence in. They're essentially the same word. Genuine faith is what? It's built on facts. Jesus died in our place for our sin and not built on a feeling of of being forgiven. True biblical belief does not stop with mental assent to the truth. It includes a heart trust or a confidence in the fact, the facts expressed by a voluntary act of the will. It's not just the facts that Jesus died in our place for our sin. I believe that Jesus has paid my sin debt. That's what it means to believe. All of this would have been really good news to the disciples. It should be good good news to all of us as well. The Bible says this, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now, I'd like to talk, just take a pause here and talk about that faith issue again and the substitute concept Again, the idea of a substitute is this. Just as the ram died in Isaac's place, so Jesus took our place. And because Jesus paid the death penalty for us, that removes the need for us to eternally pay the awful consequences of sin. So that's the concept of a substitute. But now there's the faith issue to deal with. And this is the question that each one here has to ask of themselves. Do you believe that when Jesus died on the cross, that he was doing that for you? Do you trust God? Do you take him at his word? And that is the difference of what we're talking about, having a mental ascent and true biblical, what we call saving faith that's effective. The accounts of Abraham and Isaac were stories the disciples knew very well. They would have heard about them since their childhood, but now they were seeing the whole picture for the very first time. 
As Jesus spoke, you probably could hear a pin drop. Every eye was glued on him. The promised Savior, now in their midst, was continuing his story. What's the next event we talked about? Remember the Passover? The children of Israel were slaves in Egypt, and God delivered them from the Egyptians and, 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 and Pharaoh with great plagues. The last plague was the death of the firstborn. God had said that if the Israelites followed his word, they would be safe from this tragedy. Do you recall how the Israelites were to sacrifice a lamb? Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus is our Passover lamb. It seems hardly coincidental that from Jesus' birth, he was identified with these harmless creatures. He was born in a stable where you could find little lambs sheltered, possibly feeding. His first visitors were who? Shepherds, men who cared for lambs, made sure that no harm came to them. We're told that Bethlehem, his birth city, was commissioned by the high priest as a place to raise lamb sacrifices for use in the temple. You might remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus. Look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So when we find Jesus identified as the Passover Lamb, we shouldn't be surprised. The parallels are stunning. Let's just talk about a few of them. Remember how the Passover Lamb was supposed to be selected? What did it need to be? Louder? Had to be spotless. Had to be perfect. Just like the lamb had to be perfect, no defect, what was Jesus? Sinless, perfect, had never sinned. The lamb had to be a male. Jesus was a man. The Passover lamb was killed, dying in the place of the firstborn. Jesus died in our place. The blood was applied to the doorposts and the lintel of the house. Just as safety was only found by remaining inside, so only by trusting in what Jesus did on the cross brings us safety from eternal death. When the death angel came, whenever he saw the blood, he would do what? He would pass over, right? In the same way, God provided a way for his judgment to pass over us. And in so doing, all the judgment that we deserve that should come to us because we're trusting in Christ, it passes over us and it rests on Jesus and what he did on the cross. God had specifically told the Israelites that they couldn't do what with the bones? Couldn't break one of the bones. Why? Because this was a a picture of the lamb that was to come, a foreshadowing of Jesus. Jesus' bones were not broken. Remember the Roman soldiers? When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. You can just imagine these disciples knowing all these Old Testament stories and then realizing all that Jesus had done. And they're hanging on every word, listening to him explain all the significance, even the Passover that they had celebrated so many times in the past. And they couldn't help but think of what time of year it was. Jesus had been crucified on the very day the Passover lamb died. They had no way of knowing that the priests had hoped to kill him after the feast was over, but they did know that God's plan had triumphed. Jesus not only died on the right day, but he died at the ninth hour the very hour the temple lamb was offered, the hour of the evening sacrifice. He died right on schedule, just as the Bible said he would. The scripture says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. What next? The law. Remember the Ten Commandments? The Israelites thought they would obey these very easily. Today, many people believe that you can please God by keeping these 10 rules or some modified version of them. But we saw from our study that God expects nothing less than perfect obedience. 
Um, by the way, let me take a break and just say something here real quick. There's a lot of information I'm covering. And I hope I'm stepping on a good amount of toes in the audience right now. Because the only way you're going to get anything out of this class is you're going to realize, you know what? I, like these disciples, these disciples, two on the road to Emmaus, even the 11, they were thinking the wrong way. And Jesus had to fix their thinking to what the truth was. So if a lot of what's being talked about here is totally crisscrossing your mind and going against what you thought, that actually could be a good thing if you decide to accept what God's saying, okay? So I don't mean to offend people personally, but if it means teaching the scripture and you learn something that you thought, was, you thought was true, but it was wrong, but now that you have the truth, that's a good thing. And I hope you receive that warmly. The law. So they thought they were going to obey the law easily. People think they can do that today as well. But perfect obedience is what God expects. For the one who obeys the whole law but fails at one point has become guilty of all of it. Trying to keep the Ten Commandments does not restore the broken relationship to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. The law reminds us of our age-old two-sided coin problem. We have something we don't want, which is sin and all its consequences. And we need something we don't have, which is a righteousness, a perfection, that will allow us to be in God's presence. The Ten Commandments cannot give us righteousness equal to God's righteousness. It simply was not, not why it was given. But there's good news. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Do you see what it's saying there? It's a righteousness that it's not from your trying to keep the law. The law speaks to it and the prophets speak to it. It tells about it, but it's a righteousness that comes from God through faith. That's a good thing because we failed at trying to keep the law. The Bible says that to obtain this, all we have to do is believe. It's a level of goodness that comes from God himself. You can't get better than that. It's righteousness from God apart from the law. And all we have to do is believe. It's just that simple. Simple for us, but for God, it involved a lot more. You see, God's God's just character could not overlook sin and pretend it didn't happen. Sin must be punished. There had to be death. Up to this time, man had been offering animal sacrifices as a death payment, but these were only atonement coverings, temporary coverings. Why is that? Because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. They only covered it for a time as God was looking forward to what Jesus would do. So what is the other solution? Perhaps one man would die. Perhaps you could find someone who could die for another. But then he would have to have been both sinless and willing. Can you find anyone who is sinless and willing to die for you, for to pay your sin debt? No per- such person has ever existed. Every man and woman throughout the ages has had their own personal sin debt, their own penalty to pay. You couldn't pay for someone else's. But then God himself left heaven. He left heaven and became a man, a sinless man, in one remarkable act of selfless love. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. God's just nature was satisfied by the death of Jesus, a death payment for sin. God had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished because he knew that someday Jesus would die for all sin, past, present, and future, paying the death penalty in full. Jesus died so God could demonstrate his his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. The word justified was a judicial term used in courtrooms of Jesus' day. 
Remember the events when man sinned in the garden. God took off the coat of friendship and put on a judge's robe. As a fair and just judge, God found found man guilty of crime, of breaking God's perfect law, sinning against a holy God. Man stood before a frowning God, accused and convicted as a perpetual, incurable lawbreaker. The sentence was death, eternal death. But then God, the judge, rose from his judicial bench and taking off that that robe of a judge, he put back on the coat of a friend. God left the lofty heights of heaven, descended as the God-man Jesus to stand with us in front of that bench. He had only one purpose, to take our sentence of death upon himself and pay it for us. Since he had no sin of his own to die for, he was able to die for the sin of others. He died in our place. He was able to pay sin's death penalty for all time for all mankind. Sin was gone, but righteousness was still needed. Ah, uh, yes. We saw earlier, just like Abraham, righteousness comes to us by faith. However, to provide That purity, something had to happen in God's courtroom. Jesus not only took our putrid rags of sin upon himself, but then, it's incredible, almost unbelievable, he thoroughly wraps us in his pure robes, clean robes of righteousness. He gives us a righteousness equal to God's perfection. Now, as God sits as a judge and looks across at the faces of humanity, wherever he sees one clothed in Christ's righteousness, he can honestly and justly say, in my heavenly courtroom, that man, that woman stands before me perfect. That woman, that man stands before me perfect. The almighty judge of heaven raises his gavel And with a crash, declares, righteous. That is the meaning of the word justified. To be declared righteous in God's sight. But remember, this is only true for those who believe that Jesus died in their place. The Bible says that a man is justified or declared righteous by faith. Therefore, being justified, declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. No, the Ten Commandments cannot make one righteous. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law. By the law comes the knowledge of sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The law had a purpose. The Bible says the Ten Commandments are like a teacher like a tutor, takes us by the hand and leads us to the cross and points out our need for a savior. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we, that we might be justified by faith. Everyone needs a savior. Only when clothed in the righteousness of Christ can we experience God's acceptance. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus had told the disciples he had to die. Let's think about that for a second. But the idea of having to die makes us uncomfortable. We know we don't deserve such love. Someone to die for you, to take your place. Why did, he de- why did he say that? His death was only necessary in this sense. If God had exclusively allowed the just side of his nature to rule then we would have died in our own sin. That would have been fair, but his love would not allow for that. On the other hand, if only love had ruled his character, he would have ignored sin for eternity. But that was not an option because of his just nature. Sin had to be dealt with. It was on the cross that we find the complete and perfectly balanced expression of both attributes of God's love and God's justice being met. 
For God's point of view, love and justice made the cross necessary. Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. Were we God's friends at the time? No. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, and from that same chapter, enemies, Christ died for us. Okay, we're going to ask go to some questions now. Zoom, if you want to head out to a breakout room, that's great. And we'll move forward from here. Jesus explained to the disciples. Oh, first of all, you might have any questions. Hmm? Probably. Yes. It's not, we're not talking about Chris. Thanks. Jesus explained to the disciples that Christ had to... What, needed the Christ, what did the Christ need to do? They were concerned. What was that? They were confused. They didn't know what happened on Easter morning, right? Jesus explained Christ had to do what? Die. Suffer, die, and what's that? And come back to life. Very good. Suffer, die, and come back to life. Good. Jesus used what to explain all the events surrounding his death, burial, and resurrection? Ah, you nailed it. That's exactly right. The Jewish scriptures. It's all right there. He fulfilled all of them. If you just took six of the prophecies of him fulfilling, um, it would be like covering the state of Texas in silver coins about a foot and a half deep and then picking out the right one. That's the same odds. And there was dozens, if not, I don't know if I have the count, of how many scriptures he fulfilled, especially at the cross. So we're going to pick here. This is man's situation that we talked about, Okay. And we have the titles of what man ends up in his state um, from, from the fall. And again, the reason I think it's so good to emphasize is people wonder, why is the world so wrong and bad? This is why. <laughs> this is exactly why. So from each one of these, we'll pick one of the words from the top. So man chose his own path leading to a spiritual wilderness. Man is what? What do you think, Isabel? That's Isabel over there. Yeah, actually, in his own path, idea is lost. Yeah, she was helping you there, out there. Man's friendship with God no longer exists. If the friendship is gone, they're not close anymore. What's the what's the nature of the relationship? What do you think, Chris? Yeah, it's estranged. Satan exploits man to do his will. Man is what? What do you think, Cameron? Not, not getting exploited. What do you think, D'Angelo? Yeah. Exploits. Slavery. See it every day. Man joins Satan in rebellion against God. Man is what, Gia? Actually, as in rebellion, anybody want to help her out? Yeah, it's an enemy. Though those others are true. All right, pick the last two. Man must now deal with separation, and man stand. Man stands. God's courtroom accused of breaking his holy law.
Go ahead, Larry. Say it out loud. Dead and guilty. Yep. Very good. God created man blank so that by his obedient choices, he would honor God. How did God create man? It's more than one word there, by the way. You think, Jason, did God create man like a robot? Nope. He created us with a what? That's right. With a will. Good. Man cannot make himself acceptable to God. You think, Grace? Man can't make himself acceptable? Tricky wording, huh? It's true. Man cannot make himself acceptable to God. Again, let's pick from the word word choices there at the top. I think we have an extra one, so this one will be a little little more challenging. Just as an animal died to clothe Adam and Eve in some kind of clothing, so Jesus died to make us in the presence of God. What do you think, Kieran? Yeah, that's right. Acceptable. Good. Just as Abel brought a to gain forgiveness for sin, so Jesus became the ultimate, dying so that our sin might be forgiven. What do you think, Andy? That's right. Very good. Nailed it. Just as there was blank ark and blank door to safety, so Jesus is the blank way to eternal life. What do you think, Cameron? Go ahead and read it out for me. Very good. Very good. Okay, who's got this one? Veronica? Yeah, very good. Very good. People like to say, oh, I don't believe in God. Okay, doesn't mean he's not going to judge you. It's still going to happen. Good. Although we were born into this world as enemies of God, because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can now be friends. What do you think, Abby? True, false? You listen? No? What about you, Gia? No, it's true. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can now be friends. Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to point, I'm going to take some arrows around to this one. It's the best way I could hook this one up. So just as one, as I like to put it. So when read the first one and then give me the answer. What do you think, Grace? Very good. Larry, how about the second one? Very good. Very good. Karen, can you do the last one? Very good. Very good. Good. Guess I could have been pointing arrows in the meantime. Do 
Jesse, can you read that for me? True or false? What do you guys think? True? This is how God could... False? It's true. This is how God could forgive people in the same way in the Old Testament as he does in the New Testament as he just does today. It's all based on the same truth, what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. What is true biblical faith and what is it not? I'm sharing this with the Zoom leader, and he said, there's not another slide for this. <laughs> I said, I know. I want to talk about it. What is true biblical faith? First of all, what's its synonyms? Besides faith, there's Cameron. What are the other words? Remember? Okay, saving faith. Another word for put in front of faith. Yeah. Besides faith, what else? Trust. Belief. What else? One more we kicked around. You have trust in someone, you have what in them? Confidence. That's right. And what is faith based on? On the facts? On the facts. Not based on what? It's not based on feeling. Right? The fact is Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That's a fact. True biblical faith is based on facts, not feelings. What else? What else do we know about faith? Genuinely. You said it right, genuinely. I don't know if I could say it right. Genuinely. That's right. It has to be in our hearts. It can't just be what? Yeah, it just can't be a mental assent, Right? What was the example that I gave about it not just being mentalism, but a choice, an act of the will? It starts in your heart, but it's an act of the will. Jesus died for our sins. What's the act of the will? What what is the true saving faith? To use Cameron's expression, which is a good expression, by the way. Saving faith says what with those facts? Applies it to himself. It says what? Oh, I'll start you off like with the kids, Sunday school. I'll give you the first word. I. What's that? Just turn the word association? It, it's an act of the will. So it's, it's, you take the facts, Jesus died for our sins, but you personalize it, make it real to yourself. I believe what? Jesus, come on. Jesus died for my sins. See, it's one thing to throw facts out there. Oh, yeah, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Wait a second. No, Jesus died for my sin. See, that's true biblical faith. When you can say that and believe that, okay, that that's the reality of what it means to, be, to have a right relationship with God, to believe that. Not based on feelings, based on facts. Confidence, trust, belief that Jesus died for your sins. Jesus cried, it is finished because he had done his part in paying our sin debt. Now we need to do our part. True or false? Show of hands. How many think this is true? How many think this is false? Jesus cried, it is finished because he had done his part in paying our sin debt. Now we need to do our part in paying our sin debt. Does that help clarify it? Can we do anything to pay our sin debt? No, but can we do anything to pay our sin debt? What is the only payment for sin, Andy? 
Yeah. Or, our, or my death, or your death, right? Death. So clarifying it, I like you guys. You guys maybe clarify my questions here. Jesus Christ is finished because he had done his part in paying our sin debt. Now we need to do our part paying our sin debt? True or false? It's false. It's false. If there's any part, two things. If there's any part that we need to pay, okay, we would be in eternity, in, separated from God for all eternity, like a fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Another thing is, if there was anything we could do to pay our own sin debt, I can tell you one thing, God's not going to send his son. He loves him that much. Okay? Remember what Jesus said in the garden. Is there any other way? There was no other way. Sorry, you had a question in the back? Right. No, no, no. That's absolutely true. That's why I clarified it. Now we need to do our part in paying our sin debt? No. But what is our, what is our work we need to do? Believe. Yeah, very good. Very good. Good. All right, more words to, to choose from here. This is talking about the Passover lamb, the Passover uh, context. The Passover lamb had to be perfect just as Jesus was what, Jason? Pick from the top words. Huh? Sinless, that's right. Very good. The lamb had to be a male just as Jesus was a... What, Larry? Yes. He's a man. That's right. <clears throat> the lamb died in the, in the, of the firstborn just as Jesus died in our, as our substitute. What do you think, Gia? Right. You got it. You got it. Very good. The Israelites were not to break any of the Passover lamb, just as none of Jesus were broken. What do you think, Andy? That's right. Very good. Okay, last one. Someone read that for me. Put in the answer when you got it. Right, very good. Good job, Dean. Jesus, the Lamb of God, was crucified on the same day the Passover Lamb was killed. He died at the hour the evening sacrifice was offered in the temple. True or false? What do you think, Veronica? True. He died right on time. Keeping the Ten Commandments helps us restore the broken relationship with God. What do you think, Grace? False. It only shows us that we're sinners. It's pretty good at it, too. God says we are justified. God says when we are justified, we are... You think, Isabel? The two-word definition. What's that? Is that, is that, is that, are you doing that ventriloquist thing where your words come out of Karen's mouth again? God says when we are justified, we are... Anybody want to help out, Isabel? Declared righteous. That's right. If God says that you're righteous, you're good. But I don't feel righteous. Don't ask you what you felt like. It's not based on feeling. It's based on what God says. That's a good thing. When we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, in God's eyes, we have a righteousness that is what compared to God's holiness? What do you think, Cameron? That's right. Very good. It's equal to God's holiness. Can you imagine yourself having the righteousness that's equal to God's holiness. If the Bible didn't say it, I wouldn't believe it. 
But if you think about it, it's the only, thing, the only way you could get to heaven. And God gives it by faith in Christ. We can only be found righteous by God if we what? There's no slide after this, by the way. Okay, good. Good place to start. Believe what? If we believe that Jesus died for our sins. Right? Good. Anything else to add to that? Died, was buried, was resurrected. That's a good point. I don't think it's in my answer, but it's not a bad point. Yeah. As our substitute, right? For our is the same concept. Very good. And that's how you can be found righteous by God. Declared righteous, really. Very good. Nope. That one was for discussion. All right. I kept you all a little bit later. Thanks for coming. Next week, we're going to finish our review. As you can see, we're putting all the pieces together. And I, and I hope, I hope. This has stirred up a lot of thoughts in your mind and your heart of things you used to think that were true or that weren't, and some things are changing in your heart and mind. Come back more for more next week. We'll finish that review, and the week after that will be the last class where we give these kind of the so what of it all. Okay? Thanks, y'all.